add any kind of e-blast we can with it. It probably will require some form of electronic communications, but please understand, we do not want anybody to incur any cost. It's strictly meant to incur, to, to, to manage who is coming online with us and all that. There should not be any cost to anybody. We're trying to do this. If, if there's any cost, the SDR is going to be handling all the expenses. So, uh, but if we're trying to do something fun and, and, and exciting, uh, in the event, some of the things we had to cancel, we want to keep things active in the organization in, in our area. So, uh, really looking forward to that. Um, I think Sally posted, uh, she's not able, she still had def technical difficulties. Uh, normally this is kind of her area doing stuff. Um, but she has uh, down that uh, if you are interested uh, in doing something on the Piedmont pilgrimage, if you're not aware of this yet, the Piedmont pilgrimage is going to be a little different as well. It will be in the fall. We still are going to do it. We're just not going to do it the same way we've always done it. Uh, we are going to be doing it this year in a virtual situation, which means that uh, we'll be posting videos of different people's layouts and, and an opportunity to uh, communicate with the host and maybe get your questions answered and things like that at the same time. Um, right now, they've got tentatively around about 50 layouts uh, planned to, to be able to post. And, uh, and, and communicate with members on, on certain days that they'll be hosting. And uh, we're very excited about this, something different. Uh, Mike and his committee have really stepped up and uh, done a great job of uh, having to uh, flip the whole thing inside out and, and refigure how to do this. This is, this is a whole new game plan, so uh, really exciting. Um, we originally said uh, Perry has a training camp coming up on July 18th. We're going to try to do it at his house. He had six people signed up. Um, we were just talking about it earlier. I'm not sure on the, uh, the spacing. We may we may lock in at six unless you just really really want to attend. We'll see what we can figure out space wise. We're we're trying to not overcrowd is what we're trying not to do. So uh, also, uh, if you hopefully uh, you can raise your hand too on your electronic thing if you want to. Um, if you subscribe or get the Atlanta Senior Life magazine, um, hopefully some of y'all do here locally, uh, they are going to publish an article in their magazine on the Piedmont Division and model trains uh, coming up. Uh, I think they're looking at doing it um, September, October, I think. I think it's going to be September. Um, they contacted me and, and they are they have actually gotten with four of our, our local modelers to uh, to uh, share their layouts and maybe their stories. And uh, so it should be real exciting to uh, to be able to read that coming up. So uh, doing that. Um, one of the things, uh, the other thing I wanted to also cover with you is if you have a, uh, that's why I want to explain this. If you have a model that you want to get judged, and a lot of people have been having a little extra time to work at home, they work on their models. Please get with Charlie Mason. He will coordinate with you to get your models judged some way, somehow. We will figure out some options to see what we can do. The other thing I wanted to share with you as well is that uh, <clears throat> if you have worked on a brand new layout, and this is maybe your first layout, and you've met the requirements for a golden spike, also get with Charlie, and he will be glad to uh, try to get with you and get the certificates uh, if everything qualifies for your golden spike award. So even though we're not meeting personally right now, uh, it doesn't mean things are dead in the in the water. We, we're keeping on going and keeping on and, and want to keep people active and and still give them an opportunity to uh, get their AP certificates and also their Golden Spikes certificates. So uh, really looking forward to hopefully seeing a lot of new things coming in. Um, if you've got pictures of it as well, get them in the Jim DACA. He, he will be glad to try to share them in the timetable as well. So he, he should have it out probably toward the end of June, you'll probably be seeing the timetable come out. Hopefully we'll have some things uh, resolved and finalized too as well. Um, one of the things I wanted to share with you is uh, we are not meeting the rest of the summer. Um, the church that we normally go to is closed till July 31st. And, and upon returning, if they do return in August, we don't know what their game plan is. So we will have to wait to see what they do. So we're going ahead and planning on not meeting at all in the month of July, other than training camp, and then we'll do the SCRX convention. Um, we were hoping for pizza and uh, doing a uh, swap meet, but we're not going to be able to do that. 
but in August, we will resume and have another electronic clinic uh, online here and uh, keep on moving on with that. So uh, I'm hoping and cross, cross your fingers that maybe by September, we will be able to meet somewhere, somehow, maybe in a football stadium. I don't know. We may have to meet somewhere. We, we need to get together as a group. So uh, uh, I think everybody's missing each other and want to show off what they've been working on and all that good stuff. So a lot going on, actually, a lot going on. So uh, on uh, June the 20th, I will be going to videotape uh, Charlie Crawford's uh, railroad. And uh, he's an MMR. And uh, if you stay tuned around lunchtime on June the 20th, which is a Saturday, um, it will, should be online on Facebook. And you'll be able to click on it and view the interview with Charlie and check out his model railroad in operation. He's got a fine railroad that, that, that's uh, made up of modules and uh, he's been working on it for years. And uh, Charlie and I have known each other for years and it's a gorgeous layout, lots of details. And Charlie does a couple techniques that are really, really cool. So uh, I really hope you get a chance to tune in and watch it. Um, last month, uh, Perry Lands was on, on, the, on the Facebook that we did. Perry's had over about 1,200 uh, views. Um, I think uh, Gary Fishes was on there the month before. He has had about 12 or 1,300 views as well, still getting viewed. Um, so it, it's exciting. We're getting exposure where normally when you do a Saturday or Sunday open house and you have a few visitors come by, maybe 25 or 50 visitors come by on a given Saturday weekend. Um, that's what you get. You usually get 25, 50 visitors come by. Um, so when you do this thing online, there's people, I think, Perry, what did we say? There was people from Singapore that saw yours as well? Yes, sir. There actually was There actually was somebody from Singapore. Yeah, so it's kind of cool. I mean, people all over the world are watching our videos. So I, I was really excited when I saw that, I, but I was paying attention. It wasn't just Georgia. I mean, it's all over the United States. They're viewing them. So we're real excited to try to get these videos out and share share some of our craftsmanship, our skills, and some of our great modelers in our own division. So we're really glad about that. So um, we do have a real important piece of information to share with you. Um, with things not sure how they're going to move, um, I, I've been talking to different members of the board. I've been in contact with uh, uh, Rick 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 on our our team, um, also with Bob Kelshaw. Perry and uh, uh, Jim Travis, and um, we. My concern is is that we have an election coming up in November, and so with that concern, I want to make sure that we can vote, and that means that we may not be meeting in person in November for whatever reasons. And so we we have bylaws that we do follow, and we want to make sure that we try to to meet those needs. The nominations will be coming open with uh, Chuck Hesh will be handling the nominations in the month of August. And um, if you're interested in this, you'll be able to talk to him and put your name in the for it. And uh, there's a couple of director positions. There's also going to be superintendent, director of operations, and also director of personnel opportunities. So um, I'm going to let Perry kind of, Perry, you ready to explain what we're going to do here on the, on the, on the uh, bylaws change, or not bylaw change, but on the, uh, I'll let you explain it. Yes, sir. Yeah, there was not and there has not been a bylaws change. But what the board did this evening, and I will read to you what the board did, did this evening, and then I will um, and then I'll explain it in somewhat more normal English. And so I will read it. I'm sorry, you, I won't be looking at you. What we have done is suspend the specific sections of Article 6 pertaining only to the method of voting and in-person meetings. Specifically, paragraph two, three, and four, referencing the meeting only. This suspension would be for only the 2020 election and no other election. We would then be able to use electronic means to vote using the same process that SER and NMRA currently uses and everyone would be familiar with. This method would ensure that everyone has the opportunity to cast their vote, and the division is able to provide members with the ability to vote for officers in this year, 2020. The entire board voted. There was a roll call vote. Um, the vote was unanimous. What this means is this. The 
only the sections of the bylaws that relate to either you must vote in person or using a mail-in ballot, ballot, those two segments only have been suspended only for this election, and we will use the um, same method that both the Southeast region and the national organization use for voting, that same, probably that very same voting tool. Um, nominations or, or people can select or, or are asked to be put on the ballot by going through Chuck Cash as we normally do. Um, Chuck, Chuck would then submit those to the web provider that does the voting itself. They would collect the ballots. Um, they would tabulate the votes and forward them back to us and off we would go. But we would actually have an election. We can then, once the, once the membership is back in general meeting as they're supposed to be, we can present to the membership um, a request to modify the um, bylaws to include electronic vote, voting um, on a more normal basis or in an emergency only um, as we choose, but at least for this year, even if we cannot meet in person, we can still have an election because the elections are important to the functionality of our of our division um, and for its and for the benefit of the members. Back to you, Walt. All right, I had myself muted. So. Yeah, that's okay. All right, so this was this was an important decision, but we want to make sure we're covered. As bad as I hope we can meet in November and be back together, um, everything has been changing on a month to month with us. So as I said earlier, I'm planning for the worst and hoping for the best, but I'd rather have a game plan in place than scrambling at the last second to try to figure anything out that we need to do. So uh, your board your board is hard at work. A lot of people working in the backgrounds doing things. And, and uh, sorry, Sally, she had some technical difficulties here tonight. She's our director of operations. She normally does this part of the meeting. So, you know, she, she is here online with us listening, but she's not able to communicate somehow with her system tonight. So, uh, but uh, if you've got any questions, you're welcome to contact me, contact Perry uh, or Bob Kelshaw or anybody on the board, contact us. We'll be glad to discuss this with you. Uh, but it is very important to have the elections on an annual basis the way we're always supposed to. So, uh, And amazing. if you have questions now, you can always type them into chat at the bottom of the window if you if you hover over the main meeting window kind of under underneath um walt's chin um there is a button that's listed as walt move to the left just a hair oh sorry to the right there you go yeah too far <laughs> stay right there right underneath walt's chin is a little button that says chat you can always bring it up and ask questions and that's the way you would need to ask questions during the clinic. And I will record those questions or, or keep them listed so that when John is done, he can answer questions. Okay, sorry, Walt. No, that's right. no thank you, thank you, <laughs> my chin. Um, so I wanna tell everybody, thank you. We got, uh, right now we're about 53 people online with us right now, and there may be some call-ins coming in as well. So. Uh, Really excited tonight to have everybody online with us. So what we're going to do, we're going to turn this meeting over to John Bost. Um, John's going to be doing his clinic tonight. Uh, so we're really excited to, to have John with us. John was supposed to have done the clinic um, and um, for the SCR convention. And, uh, but me and John is... Uh, I could be able to do that. I'm really excited that he can do this for us tonight. So, uh, John is a fantastic modeler. Um, I actually went to his house two years ago, three years ago. I was actually able to see uh, to see, to see his uh, layout, his gorgeous layout and craftsmanship. And then he took it all down. And he's moved. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I was impressed with his modeling skills, and and I think you're going to learn a lot from him tonight. So, uh, without that, so what we'll do, John? Well, John will. Do his clinic tonight, and then we will come. I will come back online. Hopefully, Sally may have her system running, and uh, we'll come back at the very end to wrap up things. But uh, I'm going to turn it over. I'm going to mute my own mic and turn this whole show 
to uh, John. Post. Thank you, John, for hosting. For okay. Tonight. Am I live? Yes, sure. You certainly are. Okay. And I'll, and, you, and you and you and you're granted as the as the um, um, presenter, so you should be able to share your presentation. Is it coming up? Uh, we see you, but we don't see your presentation yet. You just need okay. to go down to the share button and share content. Okay. Is that on the Cisco website? It's it's on the um it's in the it's in those buttons that are down underneath probably what is my channel. There's a, there, there's a collection of buttons down there. It's the same process we went through when you, uh, when we tested the other day. Perry, will you ask everyone to mute their phones if they're not speaking? Yeah, that's what I have done. I'm going to ask. I, I, I've been muting people. There's there are a few who are not, and I found a couple who weren't, and I've muted them. But yes, if you would please mute yourselves, because there's somebody in the background with the television and stuff on that's really kind of loud, and it's will interfere greatly with um, with John's presentation. Now John's having trouble sharing content. Yes, he is. John, it, it just like what we did when we yeah. just and if you click on the share content button and then click on um your yeah, there you go. It's going. It started. Okay. And your your drawing. I don't want to draw. <laughs> Are you still seeing me? Um, we know if we're seeing your desktop. We're seeing your WebEx meetings desktop, but we're not seeing your presentation yet, sir. Okay. For some reason it's not working. Because it's a really interesting presentation on spectrum. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah, we've got up oh, PowerPoint. So PowerPoint is now now for a second it was up. There we go. Scratch building fundamentals. Okay, thank you. I'm yeah. not sure where I was at. Sorry, folks. Yay. Okay, is that it? Are we up? Yes, sir. That is it. Okay. Sorry, everyone. Uh, we finally get there. Uh, as I mentioned, my name is John Bost. I've uh, been a member of uh, NMRA actually since 1993, but due to uh, a job, it kind of kept me out. So I've been trying to get more active since I've retired. Um, tonight, I want to focus on basically the uh, fundamentals of scratch building. What prompted this was uh, I've been working with uh, as a member of the uh, Country Roads Modular Group, and as we uh, entertain guests at uh, uh, different shows, they kept asking about, well, how did you do that? How did you do that? And I saw both their interest and their hesitation in getting into uh, scratch building. And as you talk more about it and you give them a little more uh, confidence, uh, I think that the more people will get into it. Uh, if we were meeting in person, I would ask for a show of hands of how many people have tried scratch building. But at this point, uh, it'll just be a question of, uh, of going through what my thoughts are. Um, I'm going to, um, uh, on each slide, try to show you an example of scratch building. Don't worry, it won't all be my stuff. Uh, I'll be doing uh, stuff from my group that I meet with uh, every week. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll try to uh, go through some actual examples. So 
the, the question really is, why would you want to scratch build anything? There's got to be advantages and challenges to it. Uh, and there's a technique that everybody uses. You might call it different things. Um, but um, yeah, you have to have tools, materials, and a lot of research that goes on uh, that normally your, your, your hobby supplier will do when they, they sell you a kit. Um, then I want to walk through a, a, a quick uh, project that I did several years ago um, with a, a flatbed load and, and then show you a few more scratch build examples. Um, as we go through these things, you'll see photographs on each one of them, and they're by people in my group that uh, certainly are not in the fundamentals. They have developed their skills and are, are, and are true artisans. Uh, the one you see here is an engine um, by Steve Austin on his uh, on his layout. Uh, it, it's amazing that you can build something that complex and it still runs and doesn't fall apart. Um, I'm always amazed at Steve. Uh, he does unique engines on his layout because it's uh, narrow gauge and handles iron and timber. So, you know, Steve, I have some other examples of what Steve does. Um, but why would you ever really want to scratch build anything? As you can see with Steve's model, it, it creates something unique on your layout, something that perhaps no one has or nobody's ever attempted. Um, everybody tries to make their, their layouts uh, as unique as possible. And, um, you know, this is a way of doing it. it. It really gets you excited again as a modeler. I, 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 know I love doing kits. Uh, I know a lot of people are quite good at doing kits and artisans in their own right. This sort of takes that to a new level. And it, it really stretches you both as a modeler and as an engineer. One of the things that I've always enjoyed about model railroading um, is that you get to be a civil engineer, an architectural engineer, mechanical, electrical, whatever. Um, and this sort of stretches you in, in different directions. Um, as I was talking to people in preparation for this clinic um, that are good, that I consider very good uh, scratch builders, one thing came up a lot, and it's to recreate a memory. Um, and I, I don't know why you're into modeling railroads, but a lot of it is you want to recreate a time in the past. Uh, I know I do. Um, my, I was raised in North Carolina, and my dad would take me down to the railway station. I would see the big southern diesels come in, uh, and it made an imprint on my memory. And it's, it's a time that I really enjoy with my dad. Um, and so a lot of this scratch building helps you reestablish um, your layout as to it's yours, uh, it's in a time place, it's with a class one railroad of your choice, and a lot of it is just for the sheer fun of it. Um, advantages and disadvantages, or it yeah, really challenges the way I want to phrase this. There's no limit on what you can build. Um, it's just a question of your imagination. Uh, certainly, as we talked about, it's helped define your layout and increases your confidence. Um, the challenges, if you will, are, you know, there's no step-by-step -step instructions. Um, you don't have that benefit. But then again, if you're building a layout, I'll bet you that there's no step-by-step -step instructions for that either. You have to determine what your process is, what materials you need, uh, and there's some nature of drawing and, and uh, in, involved uh, so that you make sure everything fits. Uh, same thing is true really of scratch building. It's no different, and it's a lot of what you're doing now. Um, so project planning is kind of a must. I, I, I call it uh, tools, materials, and research, and we'll kind of go through those. Uh, before I leave this slide, the, uh, the slide there is from Arnold Eves, who built a, um, um, a station for a friend of his who does Central to Georgia, and it's, a, it's huge. Uh, it's an absolute piece of art, um, and Arnold has done a number of scratch built pieces for other folks to lay out. Uh, this is in O scale, and he does it in N scale normally. So it's quite a, a challenge. It gives him something new to do, but it's uh, quite good. Okay, the tools. There's nothing magical about the tools necessary for scratch building. You probably have them today. Uh, I list a few there. You can always make them power tools rather than regular tools, and I'll bet you have those too. Uh, by, by hand saws and power saws, I don't mean the 12 inch blade saws, obviously the two inch blade saws. Um, the way you, uh, you paint the, the model, it used to be that you had a rattle can and you tried to paint something, you lost all your detail and the paints have improved dramatically in the, the number of colors you have. But an airbrush can give you more versatility and not absolutely necessary. 
a, a variety of glues. If you ask anybody in my group, I, I'm kind of crazy when it comes to glues because I've always wondered what makes them work. And I'll bet you, if you think about it, you have at least three different types of glues uh, that you use uh, regularly, if not more. Uh, there's a lot on the market. Uh, you, you certainly have a PVA glue, a polyvinyl acetate glue, like a, a um, Elmer's or a Type Bond 2. Um, those are the mildest of the glues for sure, which I guarantee you have that. Um, you probably have a styrene glue, which is harsh, but gets the job done. Uh, and you, you have a CA, a, a super glue, which is an entirely different way of gluing things. When you're doing um, scratch building, you have to do a lot of dissimilar metals or dissimilar materials, excuse me. Um, and so a variety of, of glues is necessary. I'll let that drop because if you ask anybody on my, my, my crew, uh, they'll tell you I go a little far on that. And that's worth a clinic of its own, in my opinion. Um, the basic drafting tool, I think that's one of the you know things that, that uh, model railroaders do anyway. Uh, if you don't have the basic drafting tools, get them and, and you just need basic skills uh, to be able to create the scale drawing. I consider the internet a tool, um, so it's obviously on here. Uh, I'll draw your attention to the uh, coal loader that's there uh, that was built by Alan Cole. The thing is immense. Uh, it's probably six feet long. It's on Phil Steve's layout in ball ground. If you've ever been to his layout, it's well worth seeing. Um, and it, it looks like a nightmare of, of timber, but it was done with uh, detailed drawings and it is absolutely magnificent. Um, and I don't know that another model of this thing exists the like models, but not this one. This is beautiful. Um, I wanted to put a couple of additional tools for your consideration. When I was presenting this to a friend of mine, he said, really, a scale rule is optional, and it's not. Um, it, um, a scale rule you probably have anyway. If you don't, you need to get one. They're 15 bucks, and they give you a direct readout as to what you're doing. You can live without them, but do a lot of math in your head. Um, the dividers that I show there are a drafting tool, um, and they're used for transferring measurements. Uh, the sharp edges on there and the set screw in the middle allow you to adjust it to different sizes. It's perfect for scribing a circle or an arc um, into the plastic, and uh, I'll show you uh, an example of that uh, on, on the step-by-step uh, -step that we're going to do. Um, and dividers cost uh, maybe 20 bucks. If you spend more than that, you're probably buying two good ones because you're going to be pretty brutal with them. Uh, I think they're they're quite vital for uh, just modeling in general, but, but scale uh, certainly um, the, the scratch scratch building. Uh, the linear calipers they're called vernier, but that was the uh, Swiss engineer that invented these things. Uh, the scale that goes on them, but uh, the linear caliper allows you to take very detailed measurements and transferred very detailed measurements. It does it in three ways, um, both outside, inside diameter and depth. Um, so this, this photograph I have here is directly out of the, the Harbor Freight catalog and it costs like 20 bucks. You can spend a lot more than that. Um, you don't necessarily need to. There is also a mechanical type that is useful. Um, and uh, I think Howard uh, Goodwin does a, a great job on the fundamentals of tools. So you can always, you know, always talk to Howard. Okay, materials planning is, is key because you don't have everything in, in, the, in the, the box as you do with models. You have to do some investigation on how, how much you need of what. I do a lot of work in styrene. Um, I also use other metals like aluminum and stainless steel and uh, the like. Um, so you have to put that down, figure it out. Windows and doors, there's lots of great companies that sell those. I don't scratch build windows as a general rule because I don't want to go any crazier than I am. Um, because windows are tough and they're hard to maintain. Um, I put down here trim to roof, fence to rivets, everything that you want to do to your project to make it detailed. And uh, as you'll see in some of the examples, there's a lot of things out there. Um, decals and transfer lettering, there's also using your computer, um, going and looking up old signs and finding one that fits your, uh, your, your, your mode or whatever you're doing. Um, print it out, put across it um, using uh, software tools, the name that you would like. You can print it out, put it on plastic, trim it out, weather it, and you got it. Um, there's a, a, certainly an art in that in itself, but it's become very popular. 
We talked about paints. We talked about glues. Um, when I get into structural shapes, I, I mean anything and everything that can possibly be used to assist you in putting together a great scratch built model. And that means um, going you know, into places you've probably never been before. I was talking to a, one of my wife's friends, and she said, have you ever looked at punches from uh, scrapbooking? I didn't know people did scrapbooking much. I looked at their punches. But if you go into that section of Hobby Lobby or Michaels or whatever, you'll be the only guy in there probably. Um, but you'll also see some things that you've never seen before. You didn't even know existed. Uh, shapes and, and sizes of, of punches, uh, appliques, and the like. So it's anything and everything. Um, I even got into the bead section of uh, Hobby Lobby because they sold stars, and I was trying to build an old building that they put the big rod through it, and they have the star screws on each end. So I won't tell you that I've ever been in the bead section again, but uh, you know, it's a lot of cool things there. Okay, researching your project is everything. Um, and either you're looking for details to what you're trying to build, uh, or you're, you're looking for ideas of what to build. Um, but certainly a general intercept, internet search um, using a web crawler, Google, whatever, um, and just put in, say, Southern Railway, Section House, Winston-Salem, 1942. Um, and, you know, more than likely, you're going to get a hit. Now, you're asking very specific to a very wide search, and the more specific you can get into the uh, different URLs and, and websites, the better. But that's a good place to start. Um, if you've not looked at the Sandboard fire insurance maps, uh, they're wonderful. Um, they were produced uh, from 1880 to 1985, so 105 years of those things, and, and then technology kind of replaced them. The purpose behind them was to help uh, insurance adjusters and fire departments uh, get ready for whatever's going into cities. And if you look at it, I would certainly advise you, if you haven't, to just play, spend some time on Sanborn. Um, now Georgia has uh, almost every town in Georgia on the Sanborn maps, um, and they split them into three different time sections. So you can see a lot, and you can see a lot else anywhere nationwide. It's kind of like the march of history of, of the United States kind of thing. Um, they were created so that it will give you all the, the footprint of the building um, that is that you're concerned with, uh, which gives you dimensions. And that's vital because you can have a photograph with no dimensions and it's not very useful. But Sanborn can establish that. Um, they also have, in many cases, what the production was of the, of the different factories that were that they're showing. They show the access streets, the uh, uh, fire hydrants, you name it, and, and they're really a wealth of information. I warn you, they're kind of addictive because you get into them and you really want to go further. Um, postcards, you've seen the books that have nothing but postcards about little towns and things and factories and things. There are websites that have those same postcards and there, there must be millions of them and they do sell them. Um, I'm not asking you to buy them, but I'm certainly use a lot of uh, bridges and buildings and factories because little towns used to use that to advertise themselves. Um, the Pinterest application, if you haven't looked at Pinterest, do a search on Pinterest. I guarantee you'll find a lot of, uh, of things you're looking for. By far on this list, the most important thing is your fellow NMRA members because what this group knows and is willing to share is amazing. Uh, it's one reason that every member of the group I hang out with are NMRA guys. So. Um, so that, that's probably, the, like I said, the most important one. And you can go through a lot of things. I, I, I probably not listed half of, of what I typically use. I'm a big bridge guy. Uh, I like bridges. Uh, bridge Hunter URL is, is really good for me. I'm not a big fan of eBay, uh, but I managed to buy a book off there one time that was uh, railroad engineering, and it was all kinds of metallurgy and mechanical engineering. I use it all the time. It was built and made in, uh, printed in 1887. Uh, and I found it to be a wealth of information. I'm not sure it was on the number one uh, hit parade in, in the year it was released, but there was somebody reading it. Um, I'll draw your attention to the station here in the corner. It's out by Alan Mole again. This was in his garden railway. Um, if you ever got to see it in his backyard, uh, he finally um, you know, moved inside and went to Oak Age. This is 124th. 
uh, and I'm told, I never got to see it in uh, reference, I'm told it was uh, quite good, quite magnificent. So, some things to remember when you're, you're starting out in scratch building, um, that, and I just wanted to list a few things that were kind of tactical. Um, when you're joining two sheets of plastic together in, in, in every, almost every building that occurs, you need to have a brace for the corner. And I'll show you an example later, one that I didn't do right and show you what happened. Um, but plastic, when you glue it together and you only have two thin sheets, uh, it doesn't behave very well. And most styrene glues are very hostile. They melt the plastic, it's called melding. Um, and they form a, a new type of styrene at that weld point. Um, and that is uh, a very brittle plastic. So if you have the bracing for the corner, it saves you a lot of trouble and it makes uh, makes it a little easier to make the building square. Um, when you're um, attaching one piece of, of, of plastic to another, the many times the, the strong glues are not what you want to go. Um, and you want to use the mildest glue you can. An example of that would be if you're building um, a, um, um, a, a laminate where you have a, a, a piece of 40,000 plastic and you put some masonry brick laminate over it. Um, if you can use a mild PDA type of glue, uh, a, a bonding glue with uh, you know that's mild, um, it'll you have to brace it. You put a brick on it and let it, let it cure and dry. Um, many times, if you use a, a plastic welding cement, um, you'll find that piece warped, um, or it'll be <laughs> be sitting beside the building one morning when you get up because they they tend to stretch and the stress is in the plastic. Believe it or not, plastics, the way they're made, actually have a grain. Um, and so you'll get used to seeing that. Um, but uh, the milder the plastic, that you, uh, the glue that you can use, the better. Wall spans more than five inches should be braced uh, by basswood or some structural plastic strips. I'll show you an example of where I forgot one and see if we can see what happens. Um, bracing and clamping are essential to offsetting glue stresses. Um, it, you have to wait for it to cure. Um, and you'll see an example of a bridge that I built that uh, I had to clamp it with bricks and left it for like a week to make sure everything cured. And so it wouldn't, uh, as time went by, it wouldn't uh, begin to, uh, uh, to warp. Um, you'll see a lot of complex roof designs in, in some of the examples I have. Uh, do, do yourself some favor, a favor and get a cardboard mock-up um, because that tends to show you better the drawings should tell you what the, uh, the shape should be, but they're never actually all that correct. Um, and stiff cardboard is a way to mock it up. And here's, here's something that I learned years ago. You may already know it. The best scriber in the world is the reverse side of a number 11 X-Acto blade. If you've got to cut through 40 thousandths plastic, you put your metal rule down and you take a really sharp X-Acto blade, and we, we all have you know, thousands of them, and you start to cut with the sharp side, guarantee that blade is going to go wherever it wants to go. It's going to walk all over your plastic, um, and you won't end up with a straight line. If you break off the tip, which is no trick, it breaks off anyway, um, and you turn it over, it becomes one of the best scribers you ever had, and it'll never wear out. Um, so a number of loving exacto blade, use the back side of it, um, and uh, just try it. It was probably one of the best things that I ever uh, was taught. Okay, so let's take a, a real example of something that um, I kind of worked through uh, several years ago. Um, exact Rail came out with their depressed center black car, and it was uh, number two of them in southern markings, and I absolutely thought they were magnificent. Um, and uh, they're they're rock solid when they're they're railing. I've never had one derail, certainly knock on wood. And I wanted to have an appropriate load for them. Um, when I first got out of the university, I did some engineering with a company that did air handling, and they used these what are called centrifugal blowers. They're very simple in concept. They were created in the uh, 19, uh, 1870s, and the only thing that's really changed about them is the metallurgy and the efficiency. Um, 
So the gas, the air comes in the side, goes through some uh, blades, which are spinning. Uh, they compress the air against the housing, and it goes out the out, out housing, um, uh, the outport. Um, they're extremely popular with engineers and architects for the simple reason they're highly predictable. So you see a lot of them on buildings. You see a lot of them certainly in the 40s and 50s and even today. Now they're usually enclosed today in other types of air handling housing. But in the 40s and 50s, which is what I model in the 50s, this is what they looked like in that right-hand photograph. And they got to be quite large. And we would use railways uh, in the company I worked for um, to ship them. So let's, here is the drawing um, that I did uh, in preparation for the, this was full scale HO. Um, and it's from the Heil Corporation. They did produce them in the 1940s and 50s. Um, and I tried to get two of them on there because we usually tried to, you know, to fill up the rail car for obvious reasons. And uh, they weren't necessarily bolt, uh, tied down. You could tie them down but we bolted them to the flat car. Uh, so this is what I was trying to uh, achieve. Um, as you can imagine, uh, you had to go through the, the little um, project planning that I discussed. Uh, the tools were pretty standard, and did, did need a whole bunch. Um, materials, it would be exactly what you would expect. There was a short ladder or a small ladder that I used. The reason I have a, I bought a small ladder, small ladder is because I'm, again, not totally insane. Uh, building a ladder is kind of more than I want to do. And again, the research was pretty easy because I had a personal history with it and, and I knew a great deal about how they were used. So when we start the, um, uh, the program, um, the best thing when you need four identical pieces that look like this um, is to make a, a, a pattern and transcribe it. Um, so when I cut them out, I did use dividers as I mentioned, uh, one of the alternate tools to make that arc, uh, you know, the center point of it, you know, the length of the arc, it, it works out really well and then we'll scribe it. The rest of it, again, was the backside of a number 11 exacto. Um, and had to be very careful. Again, I had to have four of them. Um, and when you start wrapping the plastic around the edge to make the depth of them, uh, if they're misaligned, you know, you can really have some downhill problems with that. Um, by the way, uh, from a scale standpoint, these things were 13 feet high HO and seven feet wide. So they were pretty, and you know, they needed a depressed center. It's kind of the function behind that. So cutting four of them out, put them together. Here's the input port. Um, you'll notice the spacers in the lower right-hand corner that I used to make the depth uh, of this, the seven foot depth. They're quite large. They're like an eighth of an inch. And the reason behind that is normally, as I mentioned earlier, when you put plastic to plastic, edge to edge, you wanna have a good support there and I wasn't gonna be able to do that. So I put as many of these thick blocks as I could, aligning the, the two sides at the, with the bottom of the, uh, um, of the, the fan, the blower itself, uh, and put them in. Um, that made a very, very rigid structure and that's what I wanted. I didn't want it to move. Again, I clamped it heavily and left it overnight uh, to let it cure. You see the input port there, that uh, ring. Unfortunately, there is no tubing that was available to make that ring, so I had to, to make it uh, out of strip plastic. If you ever wondered when you were in school why you needed to know how to calculate the perimeter of a circle, uh, this is one use of it, um, and it worked out. I did use a hair dryer on the strip plastic to soften it up, uh, to let it mold in there a little bit better, and it made it easier to get it in and get it settled as the glue uh, began to cure. Here's the other side of it with the spacers. It was obviously easier since it didn't have an input port. Um, so once I got the two sides on and let it cure, I'd do the edge wrap. Here again, you do a little bit of math uh, with the length of the curve uh, and the straight section. Uh, it's not necessary. You just wanna make it wider and longer than you need so you don't end up adding anything. You want to trim back. Um, I knew that this was going to be a little bit of a, a finger nightmare um, trying to hold that glue in all those different positions. It's not easy to clamp. Um, so I put the strip on, aligned it, and glued it, and left just the beginning of it to cure for about a day and a half. 
so when I came back, uh, it was just like that. And I was able to, I had the starting point. Now all I had to do was put the glue on and wrap this thing around. I, I used tape as a clamp. Um, it's not you know, as tight as I would like, but it was, certainly did the job here. So it began to look like that. I had the two strips, uh, both on the, uh, the right side and the left side of the blower. Uh, there was a frame uh, a, a, um, at the top at the ex uh, exit port that I had to put in. Here's what they looked like um, after I kind of got the details. When you have sheet metal that is uh, 13 feet tall and uh, four, seven feet wide, and you put compressed air through it, it's going to rattle. It's going to make a lot of noise if you don't have it properly um, uh, dampened. And so you see all the bracketry there that uh, they require. You see the brackets that held the, um, uh, the bearing blocks. The uh, fan blades were never shipped. We didn't ever ship them uh, on the uh, flat car. They were too easily damaged. And there's something about mis you know, misaligned blades at 7,000 RPMs you really don't want to think about. Um, so we put those in crates. They went in flat cars with some of the other attachment points. Um, these used uh, 70 horsepower General Electric motors. Um, and if you look in the catalogs, they don't make a 1952 70 horsepower General Electric motor. So rice build is your only option. That's just tubing and strip plastic um, uh, put together with the uh, the mounting point uh, the uh, for the electrical that went into it. We typically bolted those also to the uh, outside. They were made for out. They were made for exterior, uh, exterior, excuse me. And uh, so they they were logically put on there. When I did the trial fit, this is kind of the way they looked, and I was pretty pleased with the way they came out. You see, I've got eyes on uh, hooking eyes on there. These things were lifted up and put on tops of building with a, a very large um, mechanism or sometimes a crane. The buildings were sometimes too tall for that. So add a little paint, a few markings, and this is how it turned out. Um, the, you know, the, uh, this one, um, it was one of the ones I worked on, went to uh, a place called the Morganton uh, State Hospital. So they were labeled MSH uh, with the um, um, maintenance reporting numbers on that, which was required by contract. So um, I think it, it, it turned out really well. It's a fairly quick project. It's small. Um, so it's easy to handle. Um, so it, I've used that as an example of what scratch building can do. Um, there's other ways of doing it rather than the way I did it. Um, I actually did a 3D model of this thing from a 3D printer that our group has. Um, I, I, I won't take full credit for it. There's a friend of mine who does uh, graduate uh, teaching at Rice University for uh, 3D printing. Uh, he, I was talking to him and I told him, I said, would you like to try this? I sent him my drawings. He sent this back. He sent the, uh, the solids model back. And uh, no, and with him, it was, uh, it was already ready to go. So I turned it on to the 3D printer and produced this. Now it's a little rough because I set it on course setting. Um, the, I think the fine setting said it would print for six hours. Um, and the filament's not that expensive. It can be done once you have it in there. You can produce lots of them if you have the time. Um, I did a lot of computer work as a as a career, so doing it as a hobby I didn't care for. So anyway, it is is probably the way of the future. Um, being able to print these things. Okay, things that went wrong. These are mistakes by John. Um, and this is what happens if you don't brace a wall, both vertically and horizontally. You can see um, this is a building that was a tool and die shop on Spencer Shops. Um, and it's a long wall, it's about 15 inches, and it's a pretty big building. And I didn't put a horizontal brace. And as you can see from that rule, uh, it began to, uh, to move in its own fashion. So it was easy to fix. Um, it sort of just you know, settles the point of having to brace walls that are, are, are more than uh, probably five or six inches or so. Here's another, and this is a, this is a great one. This is the first um, scratch built that I ever did. And it's actually dated inside 1995. So it's, it's old. Um, and when I pulled it off my old layout, we just, as Walt mentioned, I just moved about two years ago. I noticed a tear in the corner. Um, it was braced in the corner, but not well enough. And certainly 
25 years, I'll allow it a little bit of dis, uh, disintegration. Um, I was talking with my group, in, in particular Steve Austin, and Steve said, I wouldn't fix it. Mm, what do you mean, Steve? I put a lot of work in this. And he said, no, I'd cover it up. So here's what I actually did with it. Um, I turned it into an abandoned mill. Um, and it came out pretty well because it was old and sagging. So it, it, it worked out pretty good. Um, so even mistakes can end up with a, with a good ending. I was trying to find something to cover up that stupid pole in my layout anyway. Okay, build, scratch build examples. And again, these aren't fundamentals um, by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, this is another one by Steve Austin for um, his Elkhorn Iron and Timber Company. Uh, and again, if you have not seen Steve's layout when you have the first opportunity, you need to. If you've seen it, it's expanded, it's amazing. Uh, but Steve does these. Um, I'm not sure, I don't know many people that do engines. So that's a, a, a beautiful example. Here's my favorite. I love this engine. Um, and Steve, uh, again, does great work. Look at the rivets, look at the detail. Um, and, and you can just imagine uh, you again you're limited only by your imagination and what you can put into these things you will also note that steve included on this photograph a centrifugal blower on the flat car behind it yeah i, I like building them in, in o scale too so uh, i appreciate steve doing that okay this is the tate uh station up in tate georgia by uh, morris smith um morris is a great woodworker and so when it comes to modeling, he's pretty good at both styrene and wood. Um, and he has probably uh, the best documented um, from a research standpoint and from a building standpoint that I've ever, I've ever seen. Every stage is, 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 uh, is documented. It would make a great clinic. Um, and again, it's not out of styrene, it's out of wood. You can see the complex roof line that he had to deal with, typical of most stations. Um, it, by the way, has a full interior and is lit. And here's the final example from Morris. Um, it's stunning. It really is. I think he did some foreshortening to it. Um, he had drawings, I think, from the original. He had uh, DOT moved it, so they had some drawings. And it still exists. So, it, you know, it was helpful to be able to match that. And even the shingles are in exact of the original. So it's a superb job. Okay, we're going to wrap this thing up. Um, as you know, I, 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 I'm kind of a bridge guy. If you were at the um, uh, the meeting last year at, at the model contest, you you saw this as part of my module for country roads. Um, I was um, privileged to uh, go through some drawings at Norfolk Southern uh, Engineering Department. A friend of mine worked uh, worked there before he retired, and I found some sketches from 1932 of the um this type of bridge um uh, viaduct bridge and uh, i got a good idea of the ratios of the um the arcs to the height things like that and it was prototype drawings they weren't really of any special because the viaduct bridge was used by almost every class one railroad and you can you can find them anywhere this was a specific type i recreated the drawings from photographs i had taken of those photographs of those drawings excuse me um, this is what came out uh, and built it for the, the layout. And it came out really well. I, I was really, really happy with the way it came out. This is a photograph that Steve Austin took when we were displaying in Charleston. Um, and it just, uh, it, it, it gave, uh, from a Southern Railway perspective and from a, uh, a, a railroad perspective overall, I like how heavy this is. It just looks like something belongs on a railroad. Now, all that said, if you ask anybody in my group, when I built this thing, it was one of my largest errors because I decided there's two ways of building the structure of this bridge. You can do it internally using the bents, the concrete bents as the structure. I try to do it with uh, with the uh, arcs being the structure to hold it together and keep it from, from moving too badly. And it worked for a while. I, I took a big sewer pipe, cut it in half, put them on there, they look great. I mean, that looks exactly like an arc. Um, but trying to max those up became a nightmare. And thus it began to sag. 
And if you, I never took a picture of it. I hope none of my group ever took a picture of it uh, because it was ridiculous. <laughs> so um, I um, went back, put it in the trash can, put it in recycling, and started over. And um, so this is kind of the result. So even when you're, you've been doing it for 30 years and you've been doing it, um, uh, and you, you've been doing railroading for a long time, you can still make some huge mistakes on these things. So um, that's uh, it for me. Um, I appreciate your attention. I appreciate you uh, joining us. Um, I love scratch building. If you want to have any questions, that's my uh, email. Um, if you want to talk, I'd be glad to do that. Uh, I'd like to thank Morris and Steve and Arnold and Alan for letting me show off their stuff. If I've made any mistakes, I apologize. <laughs> But it's a great group of guys. So I'll turn it back over to you, Walt. All right. I think Sally's here too. Sally, you online with us? I think she was trying to get her system working again. So uh John, I wanted to say thank you, man. You're a fantastic clinic. Fantastic clinic. I uh hope everybody uh enjoyed that. Uh, there might be some questions. I'm not sure. Uh if you have questions, you can use your uh chat line or you can actually raise your hand and we can unmute you and then let you ask a question. So far, there have been no questions. There was a comment about presentation mode and I'll work with our next presenters to make sure that they're not in presentation mode because it makes it a little bit easier to see the slides themselves. Okay. That was cool, John. Thank you. Yeah, very good. Thank you. I appreciate that. So, glad, glad you got Absolutely to do it, Absolutely incredible. Yeah. And you've just heard from a master. <laughs> so, uh, well, um, Sally, are you able to, are you online with us? Looking for, her. she unmuted. Uh, uh, she, she, it doesn't show that she has sound at all now, but she's unmuted. She said she thought it was working. Yeah. Okay. Hey, uh, everybody, we, uh, really want to thank you for attending tonight. Um, uh, as I mentioned, some of you may have come in a little late. Uh, mark your calendars for July the 25th. Um, we are going to be doing what they call a uh, SCRX con uh, virtual convention. Um, actually, Gordy Robinson's online with us right now from overseas. Um, he's going to be helping us with it. Um, Mike Cummings, also Mark McAllister of the SCR, is going to be sponsored by the SCR. It's going to be an SCR uh, virtual convention. And uh, we're really looking forward to it. We're going to try to have about 20 clinicians online with us uh, to do clinics. It'll be about a 10 hour presentation all day long. You can come and go or whatever you'd like. Uh, just watch our website and we'll send out e-blasts as well. And you start getting the word out probably right after the 1st of July, we'll get all the information out. You, you'll probably have to register. So we want to, want to get you out there as well. So uh, um, was there a question that came up? I saw something flash. Um, Charlie Crawford's virtual open house on the 20th. Yes, we mentioned that earlier. Yeah, we'll have it online on Facebook. You'll be able to grab it. Uh, we'll probably have it a link to uh, YouTube as well, and uh, you'll be able to watch it. I'll be filming over at his house on uh, Friday. Looking forward to it. Charlie and I have known each other a long time. So I came back to Atlanta back in the uh, early 2000s, and uh, always like going over to Charlie. He's got a fantastic railroad, so uh, should be a lot of fun. So uh, hopefully everybody is uh, doing well. I hope everybody is uh, getting through this stuff just fine. And uh, hopefully we will be able to meet again in the fall somehow, some way. I still want to have a uh, uh, pull together some kind of swap meet. We have a ton of stuff in the division. And I think a lot of you probably have things you'd like to, to maybe sell or swap as well. And uh, that was one of our things we want to try to do this year. And um, with the cancellation of the train show, we'd be exciting to try to have something we can do. So. We'll keep trying. We're, we're, we're trying to get there. We're frustrated just like everybody else trying to get things back to somewhat of a new norm, I guess you'd call it. So, but thank you everybody for attending tonight. Um, uh, I see uh, somebody's uh, saying thank you, John. That's nice. Very nice to everybody to be here tonight. We had about 50, I think about I know there was a couple people just together. So I think we had somewhere between 56 and 60 people probably attending tonight. So, there's a few people doubled up or tripled up watching together. So yep. uh, exciting. So, uh, so uh, and if you have any questions, uh, John put his email up there or you can email me and I'll get them to John as well. And uh, I think we'll have this reposted probably sometime tomorrow. Yep. Uh, on, uh, on the YouTube, we'll, we'll get a link out to everybody. So you, if you 
want to rewatch the clinic and see some of the things that he was showing you, you know, it'll be available to rewatch as well. Uh, maybe if you have more time, you want to watch it again. So everybody, thank you. Uh, just like I said, watch your, uh, watch your e-blast, watch uh, the uh, internet uh, website. And uh, we don't talk to you. Everybody have a wonderful 4th of July. And uh, we look forward to uh, meeting again in August and uh, we'll be back. So John, thank you very much. Perry, thank you very much. Yes, sir. I know you're out there somewhere. Thank you. And, and help get everything organized too. So.